Okay, well, thank you for uh, all being here. Um, so, um, okay, so let me begin. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk more about uh, solutions uh, with uh, the same symmetry, SOP cross SOQ uh, symmetry uh, in RN. Uh, I talked about self-similar solutions, and I, I have a summary here of what I uh, explained last time. So, uh, so these are the conclusions from last time. We're looking at solutions, uh, hypersurfaces that you get by uh, taking, two, taking a curve in the first quadrant and rotating it around one axis and also the other axis in a certain number of dimensions. Uh, and when you do that, you get, um, you get a certain hypersurface. If this curve is the graph of a function, that hypersurface evolves by mean curvature flow if the function satisfies this equation with lambda is zero, so without those terms, so mean curvature flow is that equation without, uh, without the term lambda is zero. Um, then uh, in studying singularities, you can do uh, a parabolic rescaling and study uh, expanding mean curvature flow or shrinking mean curvature flow. So before the singularity, you study shrinking mean curvature flow. And the substitution is this one, so let me write both of them. Uh, so for shrinking, so for t less than zero, you assume your solution, this is a solution to mean curvature flow, you assume it is of the form square root minus t times n, but now, so if you let n be fixed, then you have a self-shrinker. If you allow n to depend on time, then it is good to choose this as um, uh, your time dependency. So, and then for t positive, if you're looking for solutions after the singularity, uh, you could, again, try to write them like this, and if you write them like that, they are self-similar. Uh, expanding solutions, and so you can look for things that are not self-similar by allowing this n to depend on time. Um, okay, and so these two quantities will both, if you call that quantity tau, then uh, mean curvature flow for MT in both cases is equivalent with uh, an evolution equation, autonomous evolution equation for N as a function of tau, and that e evolution equation is this one. Velocity equals mean curvature plus lambda times x dot nu, where uh, for lambdas plus one half you get expanding uh, mean curvature flow, for lambdas minus one half you get shrinking mean curvature flow. Um, what are x and nu here? Here's my hypersurface n. Uh, x is the position vector of any point on the surface, and nu is the outward unit normal uh, at that point. Okay, and so if your hypersurface is of the form, uh, that special symmetric form, this equation is equivalent with that equation. So these are, for, for surfaces with symmetry, these are equivalent equations. Uh, and this one provides more insight, but if you want to do calculations, this thing is more useful. Okay, so then the, uh, the theorem about expanders is you can look for uh, self-similar solutions to this equation. So these are these would be uh, here. I should have written tau. Uh, so these would be solutions, stationary solutions to this equation. Um, so self-similar solutions, uh, shrinkers or expanders are solutions to this equation where you replace the right-hand side, left right, the left-hand side by zero, either here or here. Um, so for expanders, you set this equal to zero, and you set lambda is equal to plus one half, you get an ODE. Uh, and the theorem, the analysis that uh, I showed you has this conclusion that uh, if you start at a certain shooting height here, A, then there's, ex there's, a, uh, there's always a unique local solution, and for, in the case of expanders, the solution always extends. Uh, it is asymptotic to a cone uh, with slope A, capital A, um, and so that's what this says. And then uh, as you let A go to zero, you can an analyze uh, what the slope of that cone is by s dividing the region into three pieces, uh, of which I showed you only the first two last time, but the last one is kind of simple. Um, and the conclusion is that for small values of A, because near the origin the solution starts to behave like uh, that minimal surface uh, that uh, was due to Alain Carr and um, that oscillates around the stationary cone, um, that analysis showed that this opening slope 
uh, has this expansion. It's one slope of the limiting of the uh, stationary cone plus some constant times this that goes to zero uh, times something that oscillates. Uh, so it's a damped, that ex exponential oscillation as a function of log A. Uh, so if I could make a movie here on the spot and if I could take this point and drag it down, what you would see is that as I drag this point down, the asymptotic slope of that thing starts, it just oscillates like this up and down and every time it crosses the stationary, um, the stationary cone, it picks up one extra intersection. So in the limit, you get a solution that has many, many intersections and then it goes off and is asymptotic to some cone. Um, and the smaller you choose A, the closer it is to the stationary cone. Okay, then for shrinkers, uh, which you get the same equation and you just change the sign of this lambda, <coughs> you get a different, um, a, a similar but still different conclusion. So instead of having, so for most values of A that you uh, choose here, if you draw the solution, uh, you will find something that goes close to this and then does that. Um, and so it's not, does not give you something that is asymptotic to a cone. Uh, but there are, um, and then if you choose another value, you'll get something that is some, similar to that and then it does this, right? It turns over but in the other direction. In between those two values, there must have been a transition from one to the other, and that turns out to be a value of A at which the, uh, the thing is stationary to a cone. Uh, so what you can prove is that there's a sequence of A's uh, converging to zero, such that if you start at that height, you get a self-shrinker um, that is asymptotic to a cone. Uh, so I'll write them as U minus here. And um, the asymptotic slope of this cone satisfies this same equation. Um, plus something that is little o of this term. Uh, so the only difference is that for shrinkers, you only have a discrete sequence. For expanders, you have them for all A. Okay, so this leads to, um, so this leads to an example of non-uniqueness from smooth initial data for mean curvature flow. Um, <coughs> so how do, so uh, I said that very quickly last time, so let me go through that argument for, Again, so here in this picture, I have plotted the asymptotic slope uh, of the self-shrinker or expander versus the parameter A, the, the neck. Uh, so you could, call this, you could call this the width of the neck if you imagine that it's only being rotated around this axis. Um, so for shrinkers, there's only a discrete sequence of A's for which you get self-similar solutions. So, and for expanders, there's, uh, there's a solution for each A and the asymptotic slope uh, is a function that, uh, for which, and I didn't write this here, but if A goes to infinity, so here, here A is infinity, when A goes to infinity, uh, so if you start up here somewhere, you'll get a solution that just goes off like that. Uh, and the slope will become larger and larger as you choose A larger, okay? So this starts up here. It crosses this line, the horizontal line, where uh, A is, big A is one. And near, near this point, we have this expansion, so we know it crosses infinitely often and converges to one. Okay, so let's pick, um, so in this picture, so, and I don't know the numerical values of these A's. There is an expansion, so from this computation, you can also uh, get an expansion for large values of n, what the a's are, and they go to zero exponentially in n. And they're, they're quite small numbers, so if you just start, if you were doing numerics and you were solving the ODE numerically and just uh, plotting solutions here, the, um, the pictures would not look like this at all. They would, uh, so I've exaggerated the, the oscillations. The pictures, if you have this, the, the thing would look like that. Uh, so I think numerically, uh, um, I, I would expect that it takes some skill to, to detect these things numerically. Okay, so, but let's say that, uh, so if you choose, so let's say I pick the second number here and imagine that, uh, that it's over here and that it is in the second oscillation of, uh, of this pink curve. So then we know that there is a self-shrinker and there is a self-shrinker which is asymptotic to a particular cone and the slope of this cone is this height. Then I can read off, just by drawing this horizontal line, I can read off that in this picture there are one, two, three other, three expanders 
uh, that, have, that are asymptotic to that same cone. So I can now pick any of these three expanders. So what happens, this is my self-shrinker. Uh, so let's say this is t is zero. What, what is the evolution of, uh, of this self-shrinker? It shrinks to a cone like that. And it is the cone with exactly that uh, It's the cone with exactly that slope. And now you have three choices. You can, uh, you choose your, uh, you choose any of the three expanders um, and your, your evolution for positive time is square root plus t times n, n1, n2, or n3, right? So there are three ways of, uh, There are three, three forward evolutions coming out of this same cone. Uh, so that's an example of, uh, of a solution to mean curvature flow that uh, starts out being smooth, forms a singularity, and then after that, there are three different ways of uh, continuing it. And so if it didn't work with A2, then you just increase N, and if you choose a large N over here, uh, the aperture the, uh, of, the, of the cone that you get, of the shrinker cone, will be so close to one that there are many, many, many uh, expanders with that same aperture. And therefore, you can have, uh, there will be uh, uh, as many forward continuations as you like, finitely many. So, um, and so one general comment, um, so I, I wasn't here last week, but I, I think many talks were, would have been about mean curvature flow uh, for mean convex surfaces where uh, H is positive. And so none of this happens. So there has, has been an enormous uh, amount of you know, beautiful results in the, for the case of mean convex, uh, mean curvature flow. And there's a very strong theory, uh, very good compactness results. Uh, in particular, the fattening. Uh, so this was already known by Evans and Sprook and, or at that time. So Takis explained that. Uh, for mean convex flow, there are the, the fattening, this kind of example, does not happen. Uh, so the viscosity solution is. Uh, is in this case the viscosity solution forward evolution would be a set with an interior because it would have to contain so there it's still just a hypersurface afterwards it's it's the union of this this and this and everything in between um, and then there are also others coming out in this direction uh, so these non-uniqueness results uh, and the examples, so the further examples that I'm going to show you today, you, you should uh, think of these as uh, examples of what can happen if you drop the hypothesis that you're mean convex. Um, and so the theory is not as nice, uh, although I like the examples that come out. So, Yeah. Right, so a very natural question is, these examples that I gave you, none of them are compact. So I, um, and of course that uh, allows, me to si makes a, allows me to make the simplification of just looking at self-similar solutions. Uh, so now you could say, can I make, uh, does it really depend, does this, this property, does it really depend on, um, uh, the, on the compactness condition or is it really a local phenomenon if the, uh, if, uh, if I start with an initial condition that is like this and that forms a singularity here, uh, would the same thing happen? And I, uh, so the answer there is um, uh, yes. So, uh, but it is not yes in this, yeah. So you should be able to take, uh, so for mean curvature flow, how, how would you, even in this context of symmetric surfaces, I take something like this and then I cap it off like that. Okay, and now it's a compact surface. If you rotate this, this around the axis, it's a compact surface. You could figure out its topology, let's not. Um, if, if this part is large enough, and uh, this is far away large enough, and this part is also close, close enough to forming a singularity and it looks like that thing, then you should be able to adjust the number of parameters here and, cons and show that it does the same thing as this, and it is, so this is, uh, the procedure that you would use is similar to things that Velasquez has done, and also there's a paper on the non-generic, uh, the degenerate neck pinch for mean curvature flow that I worked out with him, 
Um, and I, uh, looking at, also he has uh, an example of type two blow up in, uh, for mean curvature flow. So the techniques that you would use are very similar to, uh, to those. Um, and I'm, I'm very convinced that it would work. Having said that, no one has written it up. Okay, so, so far we have non-uniqueness, you start smooth. And then there are three or 10 or a million, but a finite number of forward continuations, but different. And the examples, what I want to tell you this hour, um, I want to show you that um, actually the number, the, um, the set of forward evolutions is, uh, is not, it's not finite. It's, uh, it's infinite, and in fact, it's, uh, um, it's uncountable. Um, in fact, you can, it has a topology, and it contains sets of arbitrarily large dimension. Um, okay, so how do we get that? <coughs> and so the idea is, um, is the following. I'm going, just going to go back to this equation. The forward evolutions that I described here are uh, self-similar. And the idea is, well, what if you look at non-self-similar solutions? Uh, how many are there then? And uh, so if you look at those, uh, the answer is you find many more. So I just, I want to show you um, how those come about. And so, to make the story short, because it's Friday, um, I'm going to look at non-self-similar solutions. And so from now on, we're only concerned about what happens after the singularity. So let's say we have, uh, we've, been in the, we've been put in the position uh, of having a cone and we want to know what forward evolutions there are, either because we had a self-similar solution that shrank or some four-dimensional being produced a, an oil drop in a, a four-dimensional water tank and with electricity made a cone like this. Uh, what forward evolutions are there? So from now on, we're not going to think about t less than zero. It's a Wisconsin thing to do. Every state in the U.S. has its own motto, and the, uh, the motto of the state of Wisconsin is forward, always forward. So that's what we're going to do now. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, again, because it's Friday, I said P equal to 2. And Q equal to two, and this, oh, so for which dimensions does this work? Let me keep those here. So the, all the calculations with the coefficients that I'm writing is for these, and it works if uh, PQ is greater than or equal to two, and P plus Q is less than or equal to seven. So the is stable. Yes, yes. So. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. So the Simons cone is stable, but there, so there do exist um, expanders for other cones. So, so the Simons cone has a particular aperture. If you change, uh, so you can still solve those ODEs and take a shooting height, uh, the one thing that uh, you don't see if, uh, if the dimension is eight or more, and you've, you're not in the Simois particular case, uh, is that the aperture is a monotone function of the shooting height. So for each expander, there will be, for each aperture, there will be a unique expander. So there will be only one way forward. forward. And for the Simons cone, the, the, the forward evolution is, is just the, sing, is the Simons cone itself. Yeah, so we're, we're in these dimensions uh, today. Okay, so. That drawing 
for a bit. So what we want is uh, I want a solution for mean curvature flow for a t uh, for some short time time interval after zero. Okay, so I'll I'll substitute. Okay, so if you do this substitution, then what we really want is a solution n tau to expanding mean curvature flow. And so how does the, f uh, for, uh, for which time inter uh, interval do we want this? Well, uh, tau is log t. So as t goes to zero, tau goes to minus infinity. And as t goes, if t becomes equal to epsilon. Uh, okay, so this epsilon is not so important. What, what this shows is that we want the solution to expanding mean curvature flow to this equation where I've set lambda equal to plus one half. So we, the lambda is gone. This one is a minus. Originally, I had written, sorry, I made a mistake. Um, I, I wrote this, and so this plus should have been a minus. Unless you are Huskin, Kolding, Milis, Milis, uh, Minikazi, and, and many, many, many other people, uh, by now pretty much everybody except me, then you would have choose, chosen the opposite sign convention for the mean curvature. And then this one has to, uh, no, this stays the same. Anyway. Um, okay, so there, uh, we want a solution to this equation that has existed for all tau going back to minus infinity. Okay, so, uh, Now you can do two things. You can try to study all these. You could say, suppose I have a solution and then study its properties. Um, and that's, uh, that's a very valid thing to do, but it's not what we're trying to do here. We don't, we don't have a solution, we want one. So we can, uh, let's, let's, let's look, so we can impose further conditions and you know, if there are simplifying conditions, try to look for solutions that, have, that satisfies those conditions. So the symmetry will be one of them. Um, let's assume that n tau converges to n star as tau goes to minus infinity. So let's assume that these n taus have an initial value at taus minus infinity. So what will n star be? Um, you could look at either, so, and I'm going to assume all the time that, uh, that the hypersurface is of the form, uh, some graph of y is u of x and tau rotated around these two axes. Although par part of the, uh, Part of the story doesn't require that assumption, but you, so you're welcome to think about either this equation or that equation for now. Um, so if you have a solution that converges um, as time goes to minus infinity, it has to converge to a stationary solution. And a stationary solution is an expander. So it has to be one of the expanders that we found. Okay, so suppose that we, uh, that our uh, n star um, is uh, an expander, and so it's one of these, and let me not include the a in the notation all the time, so it's y is u of x, and that capital U is a solution of the od that you get by setting this equal to zero. Um, okay, so it's one of these things. And in particular, let's assume that um, if we have, uh, So I had an initial value here, so if
to make sure that the solution we're going to construct, um, it'll, it'll start out being uh, in, so after this transformation, as you, as you let t go to zero, what you get is the asymptotic cone of this thing. Uh, that will have to be, um, that will have to be this cone. We'll remember this. Okay, so it is asymptotic to the cone, and at some point I explained that these expanders, they all have asymptotic expansions as x goes to infinity. Uh, so the next, so they're actually, it's, uh, it's an, it's, it converges to the cone fairly, like one order uh, one, over, one over x. There's no constant term. Um, okay, so we're going to assume that. Um, and now suppose, Suppose that n tau is given by the graph of a function, y of u x tau, then, uh, then what we're trying to solve, um, so and at this point, I don't need the expander theorem or the shrinker theorem or this expansion anymore, and this picture is also not more, not relevant anymore, but this equation is. So what we're trying to find is a solution a solution to this equation with initial condition and we're trying to solve this on some time interval and I, uh, I'm just, I'll, we'll solve up to, well, up to some time tau now. Okay, so we don't care how far it goes as long as it goes all the way back to minus infinity. Um, so this is what we're trying to solve. Um, so one way, so how, one way to look at this, what kind of problem is this? Uh, there, so there are a lot of terms here on the right. Uh, what we have is u prime is f of u. So I'm going to use this notation uh, quite a bit. This, this f is an abbreviation for all those terms on the left, on the, on the right. Um, this is an autonomous differential equation. Um, so I'm going to think about this as if it were an ODE instead of a PDE. I'll just think of U as sitting in some space, some infinite dimensional space, and then it's an ODE on that space, and it defines a flow. It defines a flow on the space of functions y is u of x, and then, uh, so the, all this is terribly vague and it needs to be uh, made precise, which is what in the end makes it a long story. Um, all right, so this, this thing is expanding mean curvature flow now. And, um, This space, I'll give this space a name, we'll call it X. Um, our shrinker, sorry, our expander, U of X, the one, our chosen expander, is, uh, is a fixed point for this flow. It's a stationary solution because it satisfies the equation with zero on this side. Okay, and what we're trying to find is a solution that at time minus infinity starts at the fixed point and then moves away from it. So uh, in ODE theory, here's, here's a fixed point U. This is a cartoon of the space X. We want a solution that starts here and moves away. Okay, and there could be other solutions that start somewhere and move towards it. 
and there could be more solutions that move away. And the way to find solutions that, uh, so in other words, uh, in terms of in, in terminology of ordinary differential equations, we want the unstable manifold. We want to prove that there are orbits uh, of the flow, solutions of the differential equation, on the unstable manifold of U. And the standard way of finding the unstable manifold of a fixed point of a nonlinear system of equations is to linearize at that fixed point, look at the eigenvalues, and find positive eigenvalues. So that's, uh, um, I could cut the story really short and say that's what we're doing, and, that's, and that works. All right, so the, the summary of the whole story is that you can carry out that plan, um, and so what, so. Phi much smaller than u, let's say norm. Phi really small. Um, and then uh, phi tau is equal to, uh, well, it's equal to f of u plus phi, which is equal to f of u, plus the derivative of f at u times phi, plus something of order phi squared. And then this, of course, is zero because it's a fixed point. So what we get is the linearized equation is this. Okay, so we solve this linearized equation. And we need to find, so this is a differential operator, which you get by differentiating this thing at u. And so uh, if you look at this thing, there are some unpleasant terms, uh, but Actually, only two of them are nonlinear. These three terms are linear, so linearizing isn't, yeah, it's a short calculation, but it's, it's uh, given that it's even not as long as you might think. Okay, so it is phi xx, and now you differentiate. So there's a, something times phi x, so that gives you, um, that two comes out. So this thing gets multiplied with phi x, comes from differentiating this, then there's another one here and another one there. So there are two more terms multiplying phi x. Uh, one over x minus x over two, plus x over two, did I put? In the beginning, this sign was also wrong. I'm sorry. So the, I, I, I'm going to reveal my mistakes one at a time. Um, so the h uh, minus one half x nu had a minus. This one also needs to be a minus. Okay. So uh, since I'm not going to do any detailed calculations, uh, this won't hurt us. Times phi x. And then uh, stuff multiplying u. There are only these two depend on u. This becomes plus one over u squared. So that's, that's our linear differential operator. It, it's, a, it's a large formula. It is, however, note that these, so it is of the form AX Okay, and there's lots of theory for differential operators of this type. Um, in particular, uh, so the difficulties in studying this differential equation are, uh, so there are two of them. One is uh, there's a singular coefficient that x is zero, this one over x. That's, it's the same singularity as the Laplacian in radial coordinates, so it's not, it's not a problem. Um, and then we're on an unbounded interval that always introduces some complications, means you can't use the very standard theorems. And one of the coefficients is unbounded, this one. Um, 
Okay, so one has to deal with, so this coefficient is unbounded. All the other coefficients, as x goes to infinity, ux converges to the slope of the, uh, converges to a, so this just goes to a constant. These things go to zero, that goes to non-zero, so this goes away, so at, and this goes to zero, so at infinity, really, it's just this x over two that is important. At infinity, ux goes to infinity, so this goes away. U never gets close to zero because it is, uh, U is one fixed expander that we've chosen. It starts here. It starts at A and never gets below A. So there are no other nasty terms in this, uh, in this operator. The, the only thing that you have to worry about is, uh, is this thing. Okay, so the to-do list to make this work is um, We have to use the unstable manifold theorem. So we have to find a version of the unstable manifold theorem that finds in this setting, or find a, you know, adapt whatever we have to the best, you know, the, the nearest uh, looking version of the unstable manifold theorem that we can find. Um, analyze df of u, so study, so as a linear operator, in particular find its eigenvalues. Okay, so <clears throat> if you're not going to use the unstable manifold theorem, then you could try to prove it by hand and just uh, take, uh, as a sort of exercise in homogenization, take the proof of the unstable manifold theorem and mix it into the other part of your proof and stir it, and then you get one big long proof. Uh, but I, I like to separate these things. Um, so, there was a paper in the 1970s by uh, Irwin uh, who gave, a function, gave a, an implicit function theorem uh, proof of the uh, unstable manifold theorem um, on Banach spaces. So, and then there were many versions that followed this. improvements, uh, so the theorem that, we, that I'm going to use is if you have a map from a Banach space, and F is C1, F of zero is zero, df of zero, um, the spectrum of df of zero is disjoint from the, uh, right, so the spectrum of, uh, it's all complex, the spectrum of a linear operator is all complex numbers such that df zero minus lambda is not invertible. So if you assume that df, that there are no eigenvalues on the unit circle, so there's part of the spectrum in here and there's part of the spectrum out there. Right? And in finite dimensions, these are just isolated points. In uh, infinite dimensions, these can be, uh, they're, they're closed subsets and that's all you can say in general. Um, so for our operator, it's going to turn out that uh, the thing is uh, self-adjoint. Um, it's going to be, uh, a, a, a sequence of points accumulating at zero. So in our case, df of zero is going to be a compact operator. Um, then, the set of points in x such that uh, there exist x minus one, x minus two, x minus three in x with uh, x minus j, image of that is x minus j plus one. In other words, uh, what, in a picture, maybe it's better if I draw a picture. So here's the fixed point, the origin.
Here's the origin. Um, so a point is on the unstable set if, if there is an orbit coming out of this thing. So there's an orbit of points. So this is x. Here's x minus 1. Here's x minus 2. Here's x minus 3. So you should think of this as f inverse of x, uh, except I don't want to assume that f is uh, invertible. So instead of, instead of saying that, I'm going to say that this is f of x minus 1. And this is f of x minus 2. Note that the uh, hypothesis of the uh, theorem allows 0 to be an eigenvalue. And these converge to 0. That's, that's 0. OK, so uh, such a point x sits in the unstable set. And the theorem says that this unstable set is a near 0 is a smooth submanifold. And you can specify its tangent space. Let me not do that. Its tangent space is the eigen, is the invariant subspace of x corresponding to this, this part piece of the spectrum. So in particular, um, if you count the number of eigenvalues outside the unit circle, if that's finite, then that number gives you the dimension of this set. Um, and if all this seems very abstract, you can say that uh, you can just um, but you can summarize it that the, uh, the unstable manifold theorem in finite dimensions that you're used to holds in this setting. Okay, so we have to, so note that it, this is not the unstable manifold for flows, but it is the unstable manifold theorem for maps. Um, it is much easier to prove the unstable manifold theorem for maps rather than for flows because there are many flows, so maps can come about in many different ways. Once you write down uh, a flow, you have to prove, so you write down the differential equation, and then you want to prove that it, has a, that it defines a map. So then you have to solve the initial value problem. This version of the theorem uh, just avoids all that discussion. Uh, if you have, so we're going to apply this to the time one map of this differential equation, and this theorem says, you know, no questions asked how you got your map, this applies. Okay, so what we have to do is, okay, so, yeah. So that's our unstable manifold theorem. Okay, so apply to the time one map of this differential equation. So now we have to prove that that time one map exists. So we have to prove a short time existence theorem for extended mean curvature flow. On first, first sight, that sounds like a lot of work because there are a lot of terms and then you have a happy realization, namely, uh, wait, this thing is equivalent to mean curvature flow and we're talking about smooth initial surfaces and there is, this, there is, exist, there is short time existence for mean curvature flow. Uh, so we can just use that and then transform it back. Uh, via this, uh, right, the similarity transformation that, that we had. Okay, so that's a happy realization. It is followed by an unhappy realization. Namely, if you write this out, what do we have to prove? We have to prove that this map is differentiable, Frechet differentiable, from some bound of space to another bound of space. Um, and now you have to prove something about mean curvature flow. And if you start, if you start to unravel that, uh, it becomes, a, uh, suddenly it becomes difficult again. So it turns out that this realization actually doesn't help. So it's better to just start with this and say, I have this PDE, or in general, uh, so, so parts of what I'm saying really don't use the symmetry at all. It would work for this, for the general non-symmetric case as well, if you had a non-symmetric expander. Um, you start with this PDE, you prove the short time existence theorem, and um, you, uh, your proof has to be so good that the solution depends um, C1 on the, initial f on the initial data. So you have to find a bound of space um, X 
such that the solution depends smoothly in the norm of that Banach space on the initial data. Then you can apply Erwin's theorem. Uh, so it being Friday, I'm going to skip all that. So um, so the, the, the key ingredient is to use some old semigroup theory. So you prove that D feed, uh, this thing, this linear operator uh, generates an analytic semigroup as, as studied by the elder Sinistrari, if I'm not wrong. Uh, on and now which space do we space do we choose? And this, uh, so here I'm skipping a whole bunch of details. Uh, these functions phi uh, correspond. Those are the um, so in this picture, this is our given expander. So that one is fixed. If you add phi, you get something that is going to be close to it. Uh, it should go to zero as x goes to infinity because we want the perturbed thing still to be uh, asymptotic to the same cone. So phi has to be zero at infinity. It turns out that um, you have to, and you uh, can assume that it goes to zero really fast, exponentially fast, uh, Gaussian exponentially fast, and it's all because of this term. So let me not work that out. So you take continuous functions on R plus, or, and um, put a, the, an appropriate constant here. And that constant k is going to depend on the asymptotic slope a that we have here. Um, it is, if you do the more general version, if you take this, then, so uh, one problem is uh, The way I'm perturbing the solution is, this is the solution and I have, a, I have vertical lines, so I'm perturbing it upward. Geometrically, geometrically, the more natural thing would be to perturb it in the normal direction to the surface, okay? And if you're in a non-symmetric non case and you're using this equation, you would have to use the normal perturbation. And when you do that, then um, everything becomes a little bit more complicated, but other things simplify, in particular this weight here always becomes e to the minus x squared over eight. Uh, so now it changes because we've rotated things by some unpredictable angle. Um, okay, so it generates an analytic semigroup, and now there is abstract theory. And so there are many names associated to this. There's Aman, Saprato um, Grifar. Uh, actually, quite a few Italians. I think Sinistrari also, the senior. Um, this general theory implies uh, that uh, that the analysis is taken care of. So as long as long as soon as we've so it, it boils down to proving. Uh, that this operator generates an analytic semigroup in a suitable, suitably weighted space. Once you've done that, short time existence in that space with differentiable dependence on initial data follows uh, from, not automatically, but from stuff that's been done. And it is, it's not just C1, it is, it's real analytic, because everything in the equation is real analytic. So um, you can expand, uh, you can expand the solution in a Taylor series in the, uh, in the, in the initial pertur in the, uh, perturbation of the initial value. So it's, it's a very nice theory. Okay, so all this means that um, we could, uh, we could have skipped all this and just said we're, uh, we do formal calculations like an applied mathematician would, uh, and, and we wouldn't be wrong. Um, so the important thing now is to do is to calculate the spectrum of this operator. A 
yeah, so one more thing is, um, it generates an analytic semi-group on this thing, and it is, uh, so there's a certain, there's certain compactness. So DF is, itself is not a compact operator, it's inverse is compact. So it's, it's one of those things, the, the term, the technical term is, um, It has compact resolvent. This means that its, uh, its, its, uh, its eigenvalues form an unbounded sequence. And it is uh, self-adjoint in some weighted L2 space, which I won't write down because the weight is not very nice. So. And again, uh, I won't derive this uh, given the time of the week and day, um, but it, it follows from it follows from this expression. Um, so, and this uh, plus this is a plus. Note that we are um, well. Let me not note that. Okay, so formally symmetric. That means that the eigenvalues are all going to be real. Uh, and uh, it's also bounded from below, so there will be uh, bounded from above, so there will be a few positive eigenvalues, and then most eigenvalues will be negative. So, so the, the conclusion of all this is a theorem. Um, if So if the uh, if df of zero has uh, at least n positive eigenvalues, then along the eigenvectors and those for corresponding to those n positive eigenvalues, uh, there will be uh, an unstable set. Uh, with Okay. In particular, if zero, so and if zero is not an eigenvalue, uh, so if you can prove that, then you can just count all the positive eigenvalues and Erwin's. Uh, so this is a more a different version of the unstable manifold. This would be the fast unstable manifold. So, uh, so if you know the df zero, that zero is not an eigenvalue, then uh, then the unstable set is a manifold, and its dimension is just the number of positive eigenvalues that you can find. Okay. So. In this case, um, so for each solution, so Okay, so this implies since each of these solutions in the unstable manifold is a solution n tau for expanding mean curvature flow, you can multiply with square root t and replace tau by log t. It gives you a solution to ordinary mean curvature flow, and uh, at t, which at t is zero starts at uh, at this cone. Y is a x. All these things start at this particular cone. Um, uh, so we found an n-dimensional family of such solutions, right? So the dimension of the family of solutions that comes out of uh, the thing is at least n. Okay, so um, does this ever happen? So can we calculate, how do we calculate the number of eigenvalues? Okay, so it, what we have to do is set this equal to lambda phi and solve it. 
and with boundary conditions. Okay, so it's not a pleasant ordinary differential equation. Fortunately, it's a second order differential equation. And, um, I'm not going to use this equation anymore, so this can go. So the trick to finding, to estimating the number of positive eigenvalues of a solution uh, of this kind of differential operator is uh, to use this term comparison theorems. If you can find, uh, so, let me write a theorem. This is sort of a theorem, it's a yeah, fake theorem, uh, it's, so it's sometimes true, sometimes not, like Taki said. Um, so it is, um, so can be proved in this, in this context. So theorem, if, uh, uh, if Ax, Pxx plus Bx, Px plus Cx, phi is zero, has a solution, so what are the boundary conditions that we're imposing? Uh, at zero, the derivative has to be zero. So we have Norman boundary conditions at this, at, at zero. And um, so if, uh, if you have a solution of the linear differential equation that satisfies the boundary condition on one side with And if the solution has at least n zeros, then, uh, then this operator has n positive eigenvalues. All right, so this expression is our linearization df at u applied to phi. Okay, so we don't have to solve the whole differential equation. We only have to solve, uh, not, not for each lambda, for each eigenvalue. We only have to find a solution to this equation. And in these situations, there is, um, uh, it's not a theorem, but it's sort of folklore. Uh, there is always, if you have a family of solutions, there's always one solution to that equation that you can get. And it's, uh, so in differential geometry, they're called Jacobi fields. In PDEs, you differentiate with respect to A. particular solution. And I'm writing it like this, and it's a little bit uh, disingenuous because F was defined on that bound of space X, and the f which has boundary conditions at infinity, and uh, the phi that we're going to get will not be zero at infinity. It'll actually be very large at infinity, but that's okay. Uh, I, I, this calculation only is meant in a formal way, and here this theorem does not have any boundary conditions at infinity. So the name of this kind of theorem is uh, Sturm oscillation. So it's, it's very old. sturm liouville theorems. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, we have We have a whole family of solutions of the nonlinear equation, differentiate with respect to A. 
and apply the chain rule. Okay, so <coughs> the, um, the fee that we're going to get is, will be uh, the derivative of the solution as I change this height A here. So how does, the, how does that solution change? Well, if you're somewhere up here, um, we don't have an explicit formula for the solution, so it's not something we can compute easily, uh, or at all, numerically you could. Um, but if you're down here, then at least in this corner, we know what the solution is. So for small a, we can calculate uh, we can uh, we can calculate an approximation for uh, this derivative uh, at least near the origin. So, and if we find some zeros there, that gives us a lower bound for the number of zeros. Okay, so uh, it's roughly A times M of X over A. It's Alencar's minimal surface shrank down to uh, the origin. And if you differentiate this with respect to A, so are we allowed to differentiate this asymptotic expansion? Turns out, yes. Okay, so is this ever zero? And if you think about it a little bit, then um, what is this? Um, okay, so I'm thinking calculus does the following. So set z is x over a. This is mz minus z, bless you. It is up to minus z squared up to a factor. It's the derivative of m divided by z. So anytime that derivative has a zero, uh, we have a zero for, uh, for our eigenfunction. So a better drawing of the Allen Carr solution would be this. Uh, so what is m over x? If you pick a point on the graph, it's the slope of this line. So anytime that uh, slope has a maximum or a minimum, uh, you have a zero for the eigenfunction, okay? So you can draw all of them. So there's, there's one here, there's one there, there's one here, there's one there, right? Anytime, uh, so those, those are all zeros for this function. This thing is a solution to the homogeneous equation it has, uh, so it has infinitely many zeros. Um, it does not, that was too quick. This thing has infinitely many zeros, but most of those zeros are there at infinity, and this approximation is only valid in a large region. Uh, how large is that region? Well, it depends on how small you took A. Okay, the smaller you take A, the larger that region is. Uh, so for very small a, the conclusion is that for very small a, this thing will have many, many zeros. Okay, so uh, as a goes to zero, the number of positive eigenvalues of this thing goes to infinity. Okay, so, so the answer is, so in this statement, uh, this statement applies, and the closer our cone is to the stationary cone, the larger we could choose n. Okay, so in particular, if you were to choose um, at, bless you again, so uh, at the stationary cone, there are, yeah, you can choose any n. So the, uh, 
the, not the Simons cone, because that one is in dimension eight, but the analogs of those things, the, the, the stationary cones in dimensions four, five, six, and seven, uh, they have uh, the family, the dimension of the set of solutions for mean curvature flow, smooth solutions of mean curvature flow coming out of that thing is infinite. Um, okay, so 10 more minutes. Uh, le let me, uh, so this is in dimensions four, five, six, and seven. Uh, let's go back down to dimension three because I want to, so you can do this for three dimensions as well. The, the one thing that uh, I don't know how to do is how to form a smooth solution that forms a singularity that then becomes, uh, that then has a, a wide enough cone to uh, have non-unique continuation. <coughs> so back to our three-dimensional space. If you have a cone like this, what I want to do is I want to discuss what these solutions look like that to come out of a cone, the non-self-similar solutions, uh, because one of them looks kind of strange or does, does something um, perhaps unexpected. Okay, so if you remember, there is, a, there is this angle alpha. Uh, there exist expanders. So for, again, we have the same theorem. For any A here, there is an expander, and it's asymptotic to some cone. Uh, and if you choose this angle alpha large enough, then there will be always two of those. Uh, so if alpha is large enough, then there is one expander that does this, and there will be another one that does this. So, alpha, and so numerically, 66 degrees is enough. Uh, theoretically, if alpha is large enough, uh, so bigger than 90 degrees minus epsilon for some unknown epsilon, then uh, there are uh, two There are two expanders. And now you could apply this whole same story to these expanders, uh, linearize at one of these expanders, count the number of positive eigenvalues of the linearization, and conclude that there exist that many solutions, uh, that, you know, a, a family with that dimension of solutions coming out of that expander, and hence after blowing down, coming out of this cone. Um, so the top one uh, turns out to have, so the number of positive eigenvalues, let me call that the index. It's uh, so. Very often it's called the Morse index. So the top one turns out to have index zero always. This argument that I did here with uh, looking for small values of A and, and look, counting the number of zeros of this thing works again. Um, the difference is that, uh, is that this picture is different. It's a picture that we all know. So for surfaces of rotation in R3, what is the minimal surface starting here? It's a catenoid. Okay, how many zeros does this thing have? Well, in this picture, there's one and no more. So we will never get index higher than one, but we get index one. Okay, so the index is one. It may be that in between here there are solutions that have higher index, but I can't prove it, and the numerics suggest that it's not true, but I, I wouldn't know how to prove that either. Um, okay, so this thing has index one. Uh, that means that the, the, the family of solutions that comes out of it is, uh, is one dimensional. Um, so in particular, so one dimensional, um, so there's some redundancy, right? Are they all different? So you can produce a one dimension, if you have a solution to mean curvature flow, you can produce a one dimensional family by translating in, in time or by uh, scaling it parabolically. That gives you uh, typically different solutions, but they are equivalent under scaling, right? So it's, a, that's a non it's sort of a trivial variation. So the one dimensional family that we're getting here, uh, these things will be all be equivalent under rescaling. Uh, so what they look like is this. 
but the corresponding eigenfunction turns out to be positive. So th there are two things that can happen. So here's your expander. And let's look at the equation for, uh, for n tau, right? So let's look at expanding mean curvature flow first. Uh, what you can do is you can take this thing, it's unstable, I poke it and push it up a little bit, okay? And then what it does, it's unstable and it just moves upward monotonically. It moves upward monotonically, it does not have, uh, it's not mean convex, it uh, monotonically means that h minus one half x dot nu is greater than or equal to zero because that's the velocity for mean ex uh, expanding mean curvature flow. If you're going to study singularities for this flow and you're in a bounded region, then this will be bounded and then if you zoom in on things, it'll go to zero. So this might be good enough to, uh, to use all the mean convex theory and apply it to the solution that we get here. Okay, so um, uh, that's a suggestion, not a, not a, not a fact. Okay, so there's one solution that just goes up like that. And so if you now blow this down to uh, mean curvature flow, okay, so we say mt is square root t times n log t. Okay, so this thing convert goes upward. Where does it go? Well, the other solution is up here. That's the other one. This is the index zero one, this is the index one solution. The, so it goes up and in infinite time tau, it, um, it converges to that one. So it is a connecting orbit for the expanding, uh, extended mean curvature flow between, uh, between one fixed point and another fixed point. Uh, so if you rescale this, what, is this, what does this look like? It's a cone um, that, uh, where the neck thickens, it, um, at first slowly, and then it changes its mind and it speeds up and then in, at the end it starts to expand as if it were this one. That's what you would see. Um, and you might have to look close to see that happen actually. So it's not a qualitative change. The other solution is the one that goes down. So what does that do? Right, if you perturb this thing a little bit and you push it down, then because it's unstable, it'll keep on going down. And now again, it is monotone, but um, it'll be going down. Um, and what does it do in infinite time? Well, it would have to, if it, didn't become singular, it would have to converge to another expander, and there is no other expander of this type, because this was the lowest and with one that we have. Uh, so that means that in finite time tau, it forms a singularity here, uh, and then here you have a neck pinch, and uh, this, so ne this neck pinch you could, um, you could analyze as if it were a mean convex uh, neck pinch, so you would have to take the Huskin, Sinistrari, Kleiner, Hasselhofer theory, and see if, uh, if this term is small enough to make everything still work. Um, so this thing will separate and it splits into two. So if you take this solution, what does this thing look like in mean curvature flow? Uh, you have a cone. So let me draw the stills of the movie. It decides that it wants to stay connected, so it thickens like that, it, it forms a neck. Then at some point it changes its mind and starts going down again, and the neck pinches. And then after that, it separates after all. So, um, so this is kind of, so it's, this is a forward evolution of, uh, of, a, of a cone where the angle is more than 66 degrees. Um, one final comment and then we go for coffee. Um, yeah, so the initial condition here is a cone, so it's invariant under scaling. So you can parabolic re rescale space and time and you will get other solutions. So if for mean curvature flow this thing happens at a certain time t, then you can rescale it and you can get a similar solution that forms at, uh, at any time that you want. You can rescale it and you can make the singularity happen at any time that you want, which shows that there is no, there's no simple lower estimate uh, for um, how long it takes a solution to become singular once you've made, constructed a, slu a smooth solution, right? So this, there's one initial value and there are, you can't predict how long the solution will stay singular because the singularity could happen at, at any time. Okay, so I'll stop there. So the next hour, if you're still up for it, I'll talk about ancient, ancient ovals and uh, we'll go for coffee.